All right. Getting, uh, getting some folks on board here. Yeah. Give it a second or so. All right. Well, welcome everyone to the March Lunch with NEMA. This is Scarlett of the NEMA staff here at home in Worcester. Um, to get us started today, you can enter where you're coming in from in the chat feature here. Make sure the two says all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, it'll just go to the panelists. Mm -hmm. So you can pop up the chat feature, say hello from Worcester. Um, and this is where we're going to be asking questions. But there's also a Q&A section where you'll be polling questions to Dan as well. Reminder, this recording is going to be live on the NEMA website later today, and all slides will be available. And we see some folks coming in, so I'll turn it over to you, Dan. All right. Thank you, Scarlett. Appreciate it. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Hello from, uh, uh, and welcome to Elevator Speeches and Networking Work From Home Edition. So the, uh, the interesting thing about this is that the NEMA staff uh, coerced me into doing this lunch with Nima probably, I don't know, a month ago or better. And uh, of course, uh, at the time, it was just going to be sort of a standard issue. We'll do a lunch with Nima. I've done this elevator speech thing <clears throat> quite a few times over the last bunch of years, not knowing, of course, how different things were going to be now. And I really thought that this is an opportunity for us to um, to uh, take a look at the new landscape. What does it mean to do elevator speeches via Zoom? <laughs> and what does it mean to network via Zoom or any other uh, online application? So we'll talk a little bit about that <clears throat> as well. But in thinking about it, you know, this sort of work from home atmosphere is uh, the perfect time to, um, to think about your elevator speech, to be doing an elevator speech, because somewhere along the line, we will be crawling out of our, our holes here, our bunkers, and we'll be networking again face to face. And, uh, you know, this is a great time for us to be kind of doing this uh, career planning, personal growth stuff, strategic planning for ourselves. And uh, anyway, so that's what we're going to cover here today a little bit. And I uh, hope you enjoy it. I'm really excited to be here. So before we get started, I would love to do a poll. And uh, the poll is very simple. And hopefully you can see it. I want to get a sense of your elevator speech experience. So the question is, my elevator speech experience is, and check all that apply, I have an elevator speech and use it regularly. I wing it when I need to. I have never used an elevator speech. I'm scared to talk to people. And uh, perhaps a humorous one, I have used my elevator speech in an actual elevator. <laughs> I have, as a matter of fact. So we'll give it a couple of seconds here to see what uh what's going on here so all right we kind of hit a plateau we're going to end the polling and i'm going to share the results so most of us wing it when i need to 83 percent um and uh 14 percent of us have an elevator speech and use it regularly 11% I have never used an elevator speech, and 9% of us say I'm scared to talk to people, which is, uh, I'm scared too sometimes. And then 11% I have used my elevator speech in an actual elevator. That's a very good statistic to know. I'll remember that as we, as we move forward. Okay, so moving forward, I'm going to now share my screen, and let's see how I do that efficiently. Here we go, and um, there we go. I'm gonna... Perfect. So here's the uh, the PowerPoint: elevator speech and networking skills. And notice on the uh, column there, work from home edition. So uh, I guess you know the first thing that I want to um, let's see how do I advance the slides here. There we go. It's a little bit of a lag. The first thing I want to say about elevator speeches is that, um, you know, having a good elevator speech is really uh, sort of part of everybody's uh, successful toolkit as a museum professional. I think that it's absolutely essential that you're able to 
uh, provide sort of a core level of information to people in one minute or less. That's what an elevator speech is typically defined as, one minute or less. Um, the idea being that the elevator uh, pitch is kind of like getting on to the ground floor of an elevator uh, and with somebody and being able to impress them as you ride to the top. And so the idea of having a minute to kind of, in a very cohesive manner, be able to describe yourself describe what it is that you do, the value you bring to the world, whatever it is that you want to communicate to that person. It's a very limited kind of a time frame. So in a sense, it's part of public speaking, but it's very, uh, very focused on what it is that you can bring to uh, the conversation at that particular time that uh, basically advocates for yourself. So essentially, an elevator speech is uh, something that um, you utilize as kind of a verbal calling card. I've, I've expressed it in the past. Um, you, uh, hang on a sec, there we go. Um, you know, it's kind of a verbal calling card. The idea is that you've got this one minute to impress somebody uh, with uh, the basics of who you are and what you do and, and the like. And the thing about an elevator speech is that it really does um, set you apart from a lot of people if you're good at doing an elevator speech because it really makes you very impressive to people. Uh, you are able to uh, come off as very uh, confident. Uh, you're able to express your leadership capabilities. Uh, you're able to identify yourself as an articulate leader uh, of your museum or whatever it is that you actually do. And so the idea is to put a little time into crafting that elevator speech uh, so that you have it whenever you're able to um, uh, whenever you need it, uh, in whatever situation is uh, is presenting itself to you at any particular given time. Here is, though, um, a, a really kind of a fun um, uh, way not to do an elevator pitch, and I thought I'd uh, I'd show this to you. Let's see if this works. Ladies and gentlemen of the Star County Republican Party Executive Committee, good evening, and thank you not only for your attendance but for allowing me the opportunity to speak. And I am seeking our party's nomination for the position of Star County Treasurer on November 10th, November of 2010, excuse me. In terms of my background, I am from the village of Minerva, where I am serving my 13th year as of elected service as a Minerva Council member. In terms of education, I have a bachelor's degree in sociology, a bachelor's degree in history, a master's degree in public administration, and a master's degree in communication. I have been a Republican in times good, and I have been a Republican in times bad. Albert Einstein issued one of my most favorite quotes in the history of the spoken word, and it is as follows. In the middle of opportunity, excuse me, in the middle of difficulty lies in opportunity. I'm gonna repeat that so I have clarity tonight. In the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. This is the opportunity we've been waiting for. I wish I could see your faces right now. That is, I don't know, I've seen that a million times and I still laugh at it. That's how not to do an elevator speech. The interesting thing, if you Google uh, angry man giving speeches or something like that, this guy will come up and um, I think, you know, it's from Ohio, I think, and this was, I don't know how many years ago. Um, and uh, people ask all the time about, did he win the election? And uh, there was an interview with the guy the next day uh, on the local TV channel, and he's like this mild-mannered guy, and he admitted that he got a little passionate and heated during that uh, conversation, and uh, they asked him, did you win the election? He said, no, he didn't. <laughs> he didn't, didn't, wasn't effective, obviously, as an elevator speech. Anyway, a little humor to start. Anyway, so for the next um, uh, 50 minutes or so, we've got a little time to, uh, to go over our agenda here. We're going to talk about elevator speech basics. Um, then we're going to talk about the importance of preparation uh, in developing an elevator speech, some ideas for you to develop the content of your elevator speech, how you deliver your elevator speech, both uh, in real life and uh, then online. We'll talk a little bit about that. 
And then we're going to talk about networking skills. Um, how do we actually utilize elevator speeches in our networking situations? And again, we'll talk a little bit about the brave new world of networking online and what that means to it as well. And then we'll have a little time for uh, Q&A uh, afterwards. Um, if you do have questions while I'm talking, go ahead and uh, hit the Q&A button as Scarlett described, and she will um, interrupt uh, with, uh, with the question, and I'll try to answer it the best we can. So, um, you know, but we will have some time set aside at the end as well. So elevator speech basics. There are a few things that I'd just like to talk about in terms of my experience with uh, public speaking in general and elevator speeches in particular in my career. The first thing is that the best elevator speeches are not elevator speeches at all. They're elevator conversations. And this is a very important point because I think a lot of people, they get hung up on the idea that um, they're giving a speech to somebody that's sort of a canned, um, memorized uh, bit of information that people aren't really uh, interested in hearing. They feel like a salesperson and so forth. And uh, the way to overcome that is to really focus on it being an elevator conversation. The idea being that if you just simply are regurgitating information that you've memorized about yourself, you're talking only about yourself, that's not really impressive. Your mission is to really make yourself memorable uh, to the person that you're talking with, to be likable, to be approachable, to want have that person want to be in touch with you again. Uh, for whatever reason it might be. And the best way to do that is not just to simply talk about yourself, but to make it into a conversation. So the idea being that it's a, sort of a give and get situation, the elevator conversation. You're talking a little bit about yourself and your experiences, but you're also asking questions and getting information from that other person. So you're basically building a relationship with that person. The relationship might last uh, you know, a brief time, or it might last uh, for the rest of your professional life, you know, that you've come in contact with this person. Uh, so think about it as a conversation, first and foremost. The other thing, uh, in terms of basics, is you can't just have one elevator speech. You um, need to be very flexible with uh, what it is that you do, because you have many different uh, hats that you wear as an individual. You, of course, uh, have an elevator speech for what you do at your particular museum, say, or in your job. You know, this somebody asks, so what do you do? And what you do is you, you know, have an elevator speech for that. But think of all the other roles that you play. You might serve as a volunteer in another organization, so you need to have an elevator speech for that. You are perhaps looking for a job or, you know, advancing your career, so you probably want to have an elevator speech picked out for that as well. Uh, on and on it goes. Um, the, if this sounds like a lot of work, like you need a lot of elevator speeches, the good, um, the, the, uh, the good thing is that uh, really the success with elevator speeches is when you can come up with different little sound bites or modules that you can put together and interchange and pull out of the recesses of your memory as the situation warrants. So when you're with one particular audience, your speech is a little bit different than, you know, the other audience, but you all kind of have the, uh, the same basics. Uh, apply to each one of those elevator speeches. So you have little different modules, uh, as it were. Um, so flexibility is, is the key with elevator speeches. And of course, the question then is, um, how much time do you have to, uh, to, de to deliver the elevator speech? As I said, the rule of thumb is generally a minute or less is what the best elevator speeches are. But sometimes, um, you know, that's sort of equivalent to you getting on the ground floor and going to the top with somebody. But sometimes you only have, um, you know, the person's going to the figurative 10th floor instead of the 20th or 30th floor. So you only have maybe 30 seconds or so. So, you, you know, you have to, again, think in terms of being modular, think in terms of just like what are the little sound bites that you can develop that uh, tell your story in uh, very short, uh, you know, short little bits and then you can add to it or subtract to it as the case might be. So, again, be, uh, be flexible with it. The last thing I want to mention is, again, this fear that a lot of people have, myself included, about sounding a little bit phony when you've got an elevator speech, sort of like a used car dealer with somebody. And again, I'm just reminding you that the key to a really good elevator speech is to make it an elevator conversation. If it is only one-sided, if it's just selling yourself, you're kind of hard selling yourself. And we've all been in the situations, I'm sure, being the recipient of that kind of a thing with, from people, it's not very impressive. And, you know, you might as well just not have an elevator speech at all. So think about it being an elevator conversation. I'll reiterate that again as we move along in the, uh, in the session. And you won't feel like a used car salesman. You will feel confident that you're engaging uh, in a very authentic 
conversation, giving information about yourself, but also developing a relationship with, um, with the person you're talking with. Dan, I think your slides are just a little off center um, on the screen. It's getting a little bit cut off. Cut off in what manner? It's looking I okay. can see preparation. Okay, might just be my screen. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, so preparation um, is so absolutely important, I think, to developing any kind of um, public speaking presentation, but really important as well with elevator speeches. Um, we've all seen people that we really admire, that we think they're really great speakers, that they are uh, speaking off the cuff, it seems. They are very natural and fluid and uh, relaxed, and you know, the way they talk about themselves in elevator speeches or in longer presentations and the like. And we think that they're just doing it, making it up as they go along. And um, I have to say, that's the way it, I did things early on in my uh, career where I just sort of thought, well, I'll just wing it. And I saw from the poll, you know, a lot of us are just kind of winging it. But I do suggest this, the very, very best public speakers, the very best uh, folks that are um, very good at their elevator speeches actually prepare, prepare, they rehearse, they rehearse. Um, you know, that is something that really is the key to their success. Because when you do m rehearse, when you do prepare, um, it just then comes off much more fluid and natural. And I think that that's uh, an objective that we all have when we uh, do any sort of presentation at all, is just to come off very easy and uh, relaxed and the like. So the more you prepare, the more you think about it, the more you rehearse, the better off you're gonna be. As my good friend Mark Twain once said, it takes me three weeks to pre prepare a good impromptu speech. So good old Mark Twain prepares impromptu speeches for a long time. Think of it this way. We've heard, uh, I'm sure, before the old quote from Thomas Edison that success is 1% uh, inspiration and 99% perspiration, right? But for public speaking and elevator speeches, it's a little bit of a twist. I think that it's 1% inspiration and 99% preparation. So you think about your presentation as kind of a, an, uh, you know, an iceberg. And so the tip of the iceberg is the actual presentation itself, delivering the elevator speech. But the bulk of it, of a successful elevator speech, is the preparation that you put into it. Uh, so put a little time into it. So how do you do this? Elements of preparation. First thing is find your inspiration. It's really helpful to be thinking of role models, people that you know of that are that you admire, that you think are really good speakers, and um, you know, take a little bit of like uh, study them. I guess uh, how do they do it? What is their um, you know how do they what do they say? What's the content? But how do they deliver it? What's their tone of voice? How do they interact? How do they use their hands? You know, those kinds of things. Their body language. That's always uh, I think very helpful to find inspiration. Um, TED Talks, if you go to TED.com, those are terrific to just don't, you don't even have to worry about the content per se of, you know, those as presentations. Uh, and those aren't really elevator speeches, but they're presentations. But you get a lot of, uh, I think, inspiration for what kind of, uh, what kind of speaker you want to be, what kind of impression you want to make on people. So you get inspiration that way. Certainly, if you know somebody that you admire as a, as a good public speaker, uh, go ahead and ask them, how do they do it? What do you do to get yourself up for a presentation or when you, you know, give an elevator speech, what do you do? Because people are generally very um, uh, open to talking with folks and giving them their secrets because, you know, they generally like to pass on the tips that they've, uh, you know, that's helped them in their career. So anyway, get a little inspiration as you're thinking about your own elevator speech. Second thing is know thy audience definitely be thinking about who is it you're going to be talking to. And this is one of those things in an elevator speech situation that you typically are thinking ahead of the game. Um, I'm, I'm heading to a networking event, say, or I'm heading to the NEMA conference or whatever. And you start thinking about, well, who's going to be in there that I want to go see? Uh, who is it that I want to talk to? Are there things that I want to speak with? Or is it just in general, I need to kind of get myself up for talking at a networking event at a NEMA conference uh, to complete strangers? Uh, but then the big thing is, who are those folks? What do they want to know? Now, when you go to a NEMA conference, they're all pretty much like you. So the conversations are around, you know, what do you do? And, uh, you know, what are your experiences and the like? So you plan for that. 
But if you're at a different kind of an event, a gala with, um, you know, uh, folks that are not from your museum, say, you have to think about what are those folks interested in hearing from you or what can you do to develop a relationship with them in a conversation, that kind of thing. So get a sense of what your audience is all about and try to do some homework around that audience. Third thing is introspection. You have to build in a little introspective time if you're creating your elevator speech. And by that, I mean, you know, the, it's kind of advanced planning. Leave yourself some time uh, to, uh, to think about what is it that I want to communicate to people. Um, you know, days are much better than hours. You know, if you're thinking, if you've got a few days before you go to an event, that's great because you can start thinking about things. Uh, weeks are better than days. You know, put a little time into, um, into thinking about, you know, who you are and what kind of stories that you want to tell prior to actually meeting the, uh, you know, the elevator speech. So writing the elevator speech, this is something that I find very, very important. And again, those of us who just wing it aren't doing this, and you might want to consider this. So when you're doing the introspection, um, be maybe writing down the things that come up in your mind on little sticky notes or on scraps of paper or a piece of paper, whatever it is, um, to just kind of hear the bullet points that I want to, uh, that I want to cover. Then the actual writing is write it out, make it a script. Think about it, time it, one minute, you know, like here's what I want to say about myself. But when you write it out, then you look at it and you're able to, you know, visualize it on the paper. You're able to actually memorize uh, much of the content. And then the last thing, again, is rehearsal. It's so important, I think, to take that script and to rehearse it and rehearse it and rehearse it. Um, because the more you rehearse, the more relaxed you're going to be and the more natural and fluid it's going to sound over the course of time. Sometimes I actually rehearse in front of a mirror, you know, so that I'm cognizant of how I'm using my hands. I tend to use my hands quite a bit, and sometimes I need to tone that down. But that helps too. You know, you're actually looking at yourself, giving the presentation, and, um, you know, it helps uh, calm you a little bit because you kind of get a sense of what people will be seeing uh, when they are um, when they're talking with you. So let's talk a little bit about content. What do we put into our elevator speeches and how do we do this? Well, the first thing I wanna say is that um, it's very important to create a set of sticky ideas in your elevator speech and in any presenta presentation that you have. Uh, these are the things that you really want people to focus on and you want them to take away. What do you want them to remember about you and your presentation? And the idea is you build your entire elevator speech or your entire presentation around this handful of very, um, you know, sticky ideas, the things that they're going to stick with them. With an elevator speech, you really only want to have one or two sticky ideas because of the amount of time that you have, very little time, uh, you need to very carefully hone in. What is it that I want people to take away? So that's, again, a product of knowing your audience and, you know, then what is it that you want to communicate to them? Anything more than one or two sticky ideas, it's just going to cloud their minds. You're, they're not going to be um, remembering what it is that you, uh, what you said. So build it around sticky ideas. Secondly, thinking about uh, communicating, what is it that's special about you? Because you are a unique individual in this world. And um, what is it that uh, ultimately is very special? What's going to set you apart from everybody else that uh, is talking to this person or group of people? You want to communicate something that's very authentic about you. So think in terms of the language. You're not just a museum professional, because everybody at this event, say, is in a museum professional. But what is it that you actually do that's so special? What are you communicating to people? You know, digital content strategies or, you know, uh, what nuances of museum education are you involved in? Or if you're a director, what, you know, are your specialties in terms of being a leader in your institution? Think a little bit about what makes you special in the, in the world. What do you contribute? And that's something that you really need to think about. How do you, uh, how do you communicate that to your audience? Make sure that your elevator speech is exciting and gripping and especially to yourself. So if you've got, you know, sort of an excitement behind what it is you're saying to people, uh, they're going to be excited too. So think in terms about, you know, like, how do you, how do you amp this up a little bit? How do you make yourself excited to talk about yourself and, uh, you know, get the other person excited? So well? Dan, we have a question. Does that mean that we shouldn't use our titles? Shouldn't use your titles? Um, sure. I mean, everybody uses their titles. You know, the thing is, <clears throat> there are, uh, certain things that are standard and your title is your label in some ways. I guess what I'm suggesting is go beyond the label 
uh, because you know if you just simply say I'm a, I'm a, in the education department at XYZ Museum that's fine you know that's great but that's not very memorable but if you say I'm in the education department where I do XYZ and you know it's something that's really dynamic or I'm working on this or whatever or my passion is this that's something that I think going beyond just the label is going to help set you apart. So what do you do that's special? A lot of people work in the education department or a lot of people are museum directors or whatever, but you know, what's your passion? And the passion part kind of relates to the excitement piece. Think about creating a harmonic resonance with your, um, with your um, audience, with the person that you're speaking with. And by harmonic resonance, I mean um, literally like the ripple in the pond, you know, the idea that there's a back and forth, there's a balance, there's a good, good vibes with the person. Uh, again, that's not done just simply by uh, the, providing a discourse or a soliloquy about how great you are. That's really, um, you know, establishing a relationship with that person, creating that elevator conversation piece. So related to that is, you know, developing the conversation, you might want to be thinking about some questions that you could be ans asking that person in advance. So while you're creating your elevator speech about yourself, be thinking about generic questions that are great conversation starters with that other person. If it's generically, you know, just like, what do people like to know? So what do you do, you know, type of thing. So you have a little time to say what it is that you do, but you know, the obvious one is, so what do you do? Tell me a little bit about yourself, those kinds of things. Or more particularly, if you know, you know, where you're going in this conversation with a particular person, you might start then tailoring it to their experience. Uh, who do they, who do you know in common? What are some of your common experiences uh, that you might share? Oh, you know, this person or that person, you know, or you've been at, worked at this museum. I used to be there or I visited there. Those are all things that you can use to, um, to engage in a conversation that really makes it much, much more fluid and natural and people will remember that. Think about telling your story as a story. Now we're all storytellers in the museum field and sometimes we fail to do that with our own backgrounds and, uh, and the like. And I think an elevator speech, having a little bit of an anecdote ready for certain things. If people ask you, so what was, you know, what's the, the high point of your career or something, being able to sort of put it together as a story with a beginning and a middle and an end is very helpful. Sometimes, you know, you use this, like, how do I communicate? Uh, for example, that I created uh, a museum, uh, oh, <laughs> matter of fact, in my own case, um, when I was the, a museum director at the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation in Waltham, we did a, um, an uh, exhibit called The Widgets of 128, which was all about the uh, innovations that took place along 128 in Boston from sort of the 40s through the 60s and 70s. And the inspiration for that was actually when I was seated in my car in a traffic jam, epic traffic jam on 128. And I got thinking about, you know, all the stuff that was happening there. And it was the inspiration to it. So that story about me sitting in a traffic jam, maybe I bungled the story, <laughs> how to tell it. But, you know, the idea of I was sitting in a traffic jam and, and it dawned on me this great idea for, you know, uh, an exhibit that was, you know, record setting at the time for, uh, for our museum. That anecdote helps liven up your, your elevator speech a little bit. Related to that then is impact. Try to be thinking about using words that carry a lot of impact. So remember, since you're writing out this speech and kind of me memorizing aspects of it, you can really be uh, editing the words that you use. So, you know, the things like, well, I, I um, you know, I, I really love working in museums. You know, you might be thinking about instead saying, I, I love to, transform people's experiences or, you know, using words like transform, right? You know, love, you know, we help children aspire uh, to uh, inspire children to aspire to greater things or something along those lines. You don't want to make it too corny, but, you know, use, think about the words that you use to have maximum impact. At the same time, also be thinking about judicious use of facts and figures, because a lot of times facts and figures have impact as well. So when you're able to quantify some of the things that you do very quickly, don't give people too much data, but you know, when you say uh, something like, well, we served a lot of school children last year, you know, in my museum, that's like, oh, okay, well, everybody does that. But if you say we served, you know, 40,000 uh, children through field trips and, you know, 20% of those kids were special needs students that came, you know, to, um, to be inspired by our exhibits. That actually has a little more weight specificity and it gives you a bit of authority with what it is that you're saying. So it's important to think of those 
you know, words that have impact and facts and figures that might have impact as well. Think about structuring your elevator speech with sort of a, a very simple tiered structure, answering three basic questions. Who are you? Who, do you? who are you? What do you do? And why is it important? Why, you know, what are you contributing to the world? And if you use that kind of as the basis for perhaps your introspection and then framing your uh, elevator speech with those three questions in mind, because fundamentally that's what people want to know when they first meet you, that first good impression. Who are you? What do you do? And why do you do it? kind of a thing. That's an important aspect of, uh, you know, successful elevator speeching. Make sure that your elevator speech has a call to action. I meant to update this slide. The flip phone is kind of giving away how old <laughs> some of these slides are. Call to action. Um, I think a lot of us really uh, miss some opportunities because when we're in an elevator speech situation, we don't actually ask for the person we're uh, ask something of the person that we're uh, we're talking with um, and we're missing some opportunities so remember to especially at the tail end is a great place to put it put it um, what's your ask so if you're meeting with somebody if you're looking for a job for example and you know that this person is working at a museum that's actually hiring for uh, you know your specialty uh, make sure you ask that person who do I talk to to uh, you know, submit a resume. How do I how do I get to be part of the process? That kind of a thing. So it might be just a simple information gathering. Um, if it's uh, you know you're looking for a job in general, uh, it might be you know can I uh, talk with you a little bit more in detail? If you're say at a networking event and you want to perhaps ask to have coffee with that person, would you mind talking with me a little bit more in detail about your your own career? That kind of a thing. And it might be just simply hey, can I have your business card so that we can stay in touch? You know those kinds of things. But we'll always be thinking about what's the ask, you know, what is it that I can, you know, suggest that we stay in touch because that uh, otherwise it's just like, a, you know, nice knowing you. And then, you know, it really hasn't had as much impact as it possibly can in your career. The last tip in terms of developing your speech is get feedback. Think of your elevator speech as sort of an evolving thing. You're going to be doing this many, many, many times throughout your career. Always be getting feedback from people. Not so much, hey, what did you think of that elevator speech? It's, idiotic, but, you know, get a sense of from body language and the way you they're responding to what you're saying, um, that what works and what doesn't work and tailor it, you know, evolve it over the course of time, get a sense of, you know, this is something that I realize I should have said it differently, uh, because that person, you know, just didn't really have a great reaction to that. Maybe if I said it this way, it would be better, but be very mindful and aware about what people are thinking uh, how they're reacting to your uh, elevator speech so that you can perfect it over the course of time. And so now the last bit on elevator speech is I want to talk about is the delivery part. And, you know, I guess I'm going to lay it out there. Many of us, especially as we're first starting out in our careers, are somewhat reticent, scared to, to talk to other people. I think that, you know, we've got sort of the again, a perception of, of elevator speeches, networking, and so forth being kind of a, um, you know, uh, a phony sort of a thing. People, I don't want people to judge me as being like a salesperson or, you know, being too pushy or aggressive or whatever the case might be. So there's a lot of trepidation as we're actually developing our elevator speech. So butterflies like this in your stomach as you're approaching, you know, the big moment of, of actually talking with somebody and, you know, giving your elevator speech, that's normal. What's not normal, though, is being freaked out about, about it so much so that you are not willing to do it, you know. So anyway, here are a couple of tips to sort of get over those butterflies as you're potentially, um, you know, starting out to, uh, to do your elevator speech. First is, again, rehearse. The more you rehearse, the more you're familiar with your elevator speech or any presentation that you're giving, the better off you're going to be, the more relaxed you're going to be. You're going to be familiar with what it is that you say. And... If you do it right, if you rehearse well enough, it'll come out of your mouth as though you're giving it for the first time. Um, you know, it's it's going to sound fluid, and you have to have faith that people are going to hear that and you know really recognize that it's not a memorized speech, but you've rehearsed it enough to you know make it conversational. So anyway, the more more you rehearse, the better. Second thing is visualize yourself. A lot of times, what I do when I um, am approaching a public speaking. Uh, lectern or going into a networking event or whatever, is I take a couple of seconds to actually visualize myself 
being calm and cool and collected, like how do I want to appear? And that really does help a lot of times because it makes you re recognize, you know, sort of like, okay, I'm going to put myself in a frame of mind to be successful. Uh, a lot of us get so petrified over, oh my God, oh my God, I'm about ready to, you know, step on stage or, oh my God, I'm going to go try to meet this person that I've always wanted to meet, that type of a thing. And, um, you know, if you can just sort of give yourself a little bit of a visualizing yourself doing it well, that really helps get you over the, uh, the edge quite a bit. Hey, Dan, do you think it's more effective yeah. to rehearse with someone or by ourselves? Well, you know, I think that that's, uh, it's a great question. I think that it depends on, um, you know, what your level of confidence and trust is with the other person. I would definitely say rehearse with somebody if you've got confidence and trust. I mean, as a matter of fact, when I've done this session as a, as a face-to-face -face workshop, we always have, we spend some time actually crafting our elevator speeches and rehearsing them with other people and then, you know, doing our elevator speeches to the, to the group. So very definitely getting that immediate feedback is very helpful. Now, do you trust the person at that moment to give you honest and open feedback and so forth? Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think that that would work. If you feel like you don't have somebody that you can trust immediately, you know, just do it on your own or do it in, a, in tandem. Great. And we have someone uh, chime in saying every pitch is a rehearsal. <laughs> that's, that's very true. Life is a rehearsal, right? <laughs> or some people say life is not a rehearsal. This is really it. But uh, depending on how you look at it. But you're right. Every time you use it, and I guess that's the point about the feedback thing, is that, you know, the more you do it, the more confident you're going to be. You're going to evolve and adapt and so forth and pay attention to that. You're going to be, you know, absolutely fine. Uh, smiling is one other aspect of the delivery. Sometimes we get so freaked out that we're, you know, stone faced trying to remember what we're going to say and whatever. So try to remember to, you know, to smile because it does make you much more engaging to the other person. And it also helps you uh, relax a bit yourself. Sometimes it's tough when we're scared to death, but, you know, kind of remember forcing yourself to smile is very definitely something that helps, um, helps out quite a bit. Remember to slow down. This is another thing that uh, very often our adrenaline kicks us into overdrive and we find ourselves talking at 90 miles an hour and you're kind of that voice in the back of your head saying, whoa, man, you're like on caffeine or something here. You got to slow down. Maybe the person that you're talking with is looking at you like, wow, this is person words are coming out of their mouth and they're focusing so much on you talking fast. that They're not concentrating on you uh the content that you have and so forth so give yourself some cues if that little voice says whoa you're talking really fast just immediately try to slow down take a breath breathing is so important with anything but you know slowing down and then just give yourself a uh, you know a moment where you can take a breath take a sip of water if you find yourself really uh, flipped out and moving on but you know give yourself some cues and a, and a, a bit basic awareness to slow it down a little bit now, Zoom elevators. I kind of made this up as I went along yesterday as I was tailoring this. Some interesting thoughts about Zoom, and I'm using Zoom as sort of the catch-all uh, phrase, whatever we're doing now these days with technology. But, you know, how are we potentially giving elevator speeches over Zoom? Well, you know, we're still, depending on how long all of this, um, you know, social distancing and home uh, you know, the home imprisonment or <laughs> whatever lasts, you know, it's very likely that we're going to be seeing much more uh, of this sort of a platform to do things that we've been doing in the past. Job interviews, perhaps, certainly networking, just meetings and so forth. These are all things that, you know, you're talking with people that perhaps you don't know that, you know, it's like just like a meeting face to face and you need to prepare your elevator speech for those things. Uh, the same way that you would be in real life and perhaps a little bit different. So here's some of the things that I came up with off the top of my head uh, specifically for doing these things at home. First of all, control the set. Notice the, you know, the books back there. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, this is sort of a default. This is now my home office in my library. So the books are there. But it communicates a little something. I mean, at least that uh, presumably I have a whole bunch of books. But, you know, it sort of says, well, he's serious. He's got, you know, he's, he reads, you know, so maybe I've read him, maybe I don't. But, uh, you know, think about the backdrop. One of the things that I've noticed in this uh, last couple of weeks is on these endless Zoom calls, um, you know, you're getting, the, you're getting the inside scoop on some people. You're getting to see their houses. 
And, uh, you know, that's really important. I mean, I've been on a couple of calls where, wait a minute, I'm in this person's bedroom and I'm seeing, you know, stuff that's behind them. And, you know, it's like, well, is that what it is that you want to communicate to people? So control the set. Uh, I know on the on Zoom anyway, I haven't figured out how to do it and I probably wouldn't anyway, but they have a green screen uh, capability where you can set it to a green screen and, and have like clouds or, uh, you know, behind you or, um, you know, a, a city skyline or sort of like they do on, you know, the news, uh, TV news sets or whatever. You can do that. Uh, I don't know if that's cool or not cool. It seems a little contrived to me. But uh, anyway, think about the set. Dress code. Um, we're all way more casual now, um, you know, working from home. I think that if you actually wore a suit and tie, you know, people would say like, what's up with this person? They're at home, they're doing this thing. But, you know, I don't know the answer to it. If it's a job interview, you know, you probably would want to, you know, maybe dress up a little bit more, but I think that it's a lot more casual right now anyway. So don't sweat it. The big thing is, is don't assume though, that it's only from the waist up that people are going to see. Uh, because uh, there are hysterical examples of people that are, you know, actually look pretty good, but then they forget and they go out to, you know, close the door or answer, and then they're wearing their pajama bottoms or something, and it kind of screws up the look. So be thinking about, you know, actually dressing for success, uh, no matter what you do. Think about the lighting and the glare. That's one thing. Um, this is not ideal. I've got two windows going, and I have overhead lights going here, like that. Um, you know, it's it's okay. People can see me okay, um, and that's fine. Uh, watch if you wear glasses where the glare goes, because that then tends to, you know, uh, filter out what it is that you're uh, trying to say. It's hard to communicate with people if you've got a lot of glare coming off your glasses. Um, some people wear headsets, others don't. I think that's a kind of a product of, number one, your comfort level. Number two, what else is happening in your environment, which I'll talk about in a second, you know, that you don't want people to hear the whole conversation, you need to be a little more quiet. Um, you know, I've been wearing, uh, when I do wear them, I, iPhone earbuds, uh, you know, that type of thing as opposed to the air traffic controller look. But, you know, I think that people are getting more and more used to any of those looks. Um, eye contact, you know, sort of like when you deliver a, a, an elevator speech in real life, you really want to do, make eye contact, show that you're, you know, showing them respect and so forth. It's a little more difficult when you are doing it remotely, uh, but do be thinking uh, from time to time about where are you looking uh, so that, you know, you're actually looking at the person in the eye more than you are looking down or looking at notes and that type of a thing. So think about your eye contact. Connections and audio. I think that, you know, that's another piece of it is making sure that you've got good internet connections so that you're not uh, flipping out and you're not, and it's hard to understand you. And also audio, be paying attention to when you've got speakers going that are providing feedback and so forth and freaking everybody out. So I think that that's an important thing to be cognizant about too. And then the environment, dogs, kids, and roommates. It's a fact of life that wherever we are now that we're working from our home, that um, there are going to be potential um, interruptions from you know your pets and kids running into the room or roommates that are around and so forth the big thing is that if you have it controlled so that you know that you're presenting uh, a webinar you're going to be on a call you kind of let at least the roommates and the kids you know know that you're going to do this uh, and you know try to keep them out of the room or you know uh, pandemonium at a minimum can't do much about your dogs I think you know again we're all informal those are things that are now kind of comical and you know everybody's understanding that you're at home so your dog's gonna bark or you know kittens gonna climb on your head or something like that um, we're much more tolerant of that so, right now. Dan going back to the eye contact do you think people should be looking at the camera or the screen any suggestions? Well I think that you know the the idea of how do you do it in a conversation um, you know, when you're in a conversation, you want to create eye contact, especially when you're making a point with some, to, you know, that you want people to remember, because the eye contact is something that solidifies what it is that you're saying. Um, and, you know, it provides sort of this anchor, a direct, uh, you know, the, the vibes of what I'm saying going into your, you know, your presence. Um, but when you're talking to somebody in real life, you're also not staring at them. You're not doing it because that weirds people out. So you do have an appropriate amount of looking away, looking more natural and casual, down, back up, and so forth. And it's what you are cognizant of 
speaking, I think the rules apply here as well. It's just a little bit strange because you're looking at a little dot on your computer as opposed to, you know, the person in the eye. But understanding if you kind of think about that person there and that's the eye contact you make, you know, so you're going to be appropriately not just staring. The more you stare, the more canned the speech looks like. You know, I'm memorizing it and I'm looking into this thing and that's that. I'm like a, an anchor person on TV as opposed to being a human being that's connecting but also looking away. So let's talk about uh, networking for a couple of minutes here. Networking, I have to say, is one of those subjects that is, um, you know, like elevator speeches in general. Um, it provides people with a lot of trepidation because they're very concerned about you know, feeling rejected, feeling uh, a failure, they're, you know, they're scared to, you know, to sort of muster the courage to go up to a complete stranger and start talking. And this is where the elevator speech thing works out. You know, it's like, well, you know, you have to use the elevator speech in networking situations if you're going to do it uh, effectively. So what are some of the things that uh, we can talk about with networking? So here's a slide that now in hindsight I love. How many people here are actually social distancing? Not, uh, not, not too many, as I can see. So maybe this is old school, and actually I wonder how networking events are gonna look like, what they're gonna look like in the coming years. You know, are we all gonna, the default being six feet apart and so forth? And we have a question coming in. I'm just gonna allow Sarah Yellen to talk. Sarah, can we hear you? Oh, wow. Unmute yourself, Sarah. Sarah, you're gonna have to unmute yourself. There you go. There you go. Okay, I actually don't have a question. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> hey, All right, Sarah. I should ask you a question, but <laughs> it works though. Thank you for doing that, Sarah. I appreciate it. Anyway, I think that you know the thing about networking is um, you know ultimately uh, you have to recognize it as being a hack. That you got to have the skills to do this if you're going to be able to advance your career. Um, you know, it's kind of an old adage that it's not what you know, but who you know that gets you advanced in your career. And, um, you know, ultimately it's being able to take advantage of the informal um, opportunities at say a NEMA conference or in meetings or whatever the case might be to, um, to actually get to know people. And this is where, you know, having an elevator speech ready, it makes you more relaxed to be able to go up to somebody in you know the buffet line or whatever the case might be and break the ice and say hi i'm so and so because those are the moments that people really do remember you and that's where you know when people are hiring or when they need the information or whatever you become then uh, much more of a resource for them whether it's they they're going to hire you or whether they're going to reach out and collaborate with you or whatever the case might be so you have to sort of you know get yourself in the mindset that this is not something that's phony and terrible but it's part of my career and I need to take charge of it. One of the things, a great resource that I came up with a bunch of years ago, um, this is a little chart called How to Work a Room. And I think it's still online. It's by a, a networking consultant. I didn't know there was such a thing. Her name is Diane Darling. She is here in Boston. And her website is uh, effectivenetworking.com. Um, and um, I believe this is still free to download. And it's a cool little schematic that I've used myself, um, not just in workshops, but I've used it myself. Great little pointers, uh, little infographics about, you know, this person that's starting out uh, into a networking situation and like, how do you go about navigating the room? How do you work a room to, you know, be a great networker? A lot of great tips. Like one of the things that I learned there is how do you do your business cards? I always have my own business cards in my left hand pocket. And so outgoing business cards, meaning when I give my card to somebody, I know always that's my left hand. Incoming business cards go into my right hand pocket. So, you know, they're not confused. I thought well, that's brilliant, but you always have, you know, sort of that card exchange thing going. So anyway, I encourage you to, to take a look at that. These are sort of tips that you can use on a regular basis. Zoom networking, last thing I'm gonna talk about and then we'll, throw it open to a couple more questions. So how are we networking now in this, you know, digital age? Um, so the first thing I will say, and I got to credit Scarlett here for coming up with the idea. I think it was you anyway. The first time I heard about it was, let's, let's think about doing some virtual meetups where NEMA, you know, has in the past, um, we have done a lot of 
uh, in real life meetups uh, in different places around our region. Um, specifically, you know, drinking at bars after hours, you know, that type of thing, casual um, interactions with people. Can't do that now. Why don't we do it virtually? So we had our first one last night uh, with in Worcester, and I say in Worcester, it was for the Worcester area people. We're going to do one tonight that I'm going to host up on the North Shore of Boston, which um, is where I live. And we're doing one then tomorrow night. And I say night, it's like 5.15 to 6.15. Uh, for people that are in the Hartford area. So if you're interested in joining those, uh, go to our website and you can still uh, sign up and, and join us. And the idea is going to be though, it's just like, okay, we're going to be in a little meeting room on Zoom and like, what are we chatting about? And you can bring your own drinks and, you know, that kind of thing. But this is, you know, what we are working with right now. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that, especially as we move deeper and deeper into you know, the continued shelter in place kind of a thing. People are looking for outlets to connect and the like. So you're going to have a lot more of those. One thing to ask with these virtual meetups is, is there a theme? And it's kind of back to the know thy audience idea. But, you know, um, you know, if there's a theme, if you're meeting with educators, you know, fellow educators, you're meeting with general museum people, uh, but locally, think about what, you know, what is the connection of everybody that's going to be there and be thinking about some conversation starters, ways that you can plug into the conversation um, in that uh, regard. So do your homework on your attendees and what the theme might be. Um, like any networking situation, you got to find your openings. You don't want to be, um, you know, completely dominating the conversation, but you want to be able to, you know, appropriately put your two cents in or, you know, if the conversation is lagging, you might want to lead a bit of the conversation, that type of a thing. Um, just like a face-to-face -face networking event, but be cognizant of what people are doing. And always be thinking about one-on-one -on -one chats. So in other words, like at a regular meetup, you know, a lot of times the magic of, of meeting then sort of, you're talking to a big group of people, but there's also opportunities for you to be pulling people aside and talking over here a little bit and you get a little bit more of a, I get to know you and hey, why don't we have a conversation later on or a meeting you know, next week or whatever. You can still do that when you're in these virtual meetups thanks to the chat feature because I believe, and now I'm saying that, I wonder <laughs> if that's true or not. Uh, I, I, am, I know it is in the meetings where at least our meetups are taking place. You go to the chat feature and instead of chatting with the group, you can actually identify one of the participants. And so you can you know, ping that person one-on-one -on -one and say, oh, hey, by the way, I saw that you're from the XYZ Museum. I, would you, you know, can we talk a little bit offline about uh, you know, an idea that I have or whatever the case might be? So um, you can, you can do, still do a little bit of that one-on-one -on -one chat thing uh, via Zoom. So that's it for elevator speeches and networking, um, work from home edition. Scarlett, what are the questions? Any more? Uh, I haven't seen a question just yet, but it looks like somebody kind of seconded the idea of locating the speaker at the top center of the monitor where the camera's built in so that when they look at the speaker, they're making eye contact and they find that most natural. And yep. then thanks Guy so for sharing the link to the room diagram as well. Oh, he did. All right. Hey, guy. How are you? Yeah, you found it. Good. Yeah, it's still effective. The styles might look a little dated in there, but whatever. Oh, and by the, the, the speaker thing, you're talking about speaker view versus gallery view, I think, is maybe what, uh, what you're suggesting. Perhaps, and there's a little toggle up at the top. I think we're all kind of learning Zoom if we didn't know it before, you know, very quickly trying to navigate some of this stuff. So it's still a little bit of a mystery on you know how to how to navigate these things i'm sure we'll be getting you know much more proficient at it in the uh, in the coming weeks okay what else do we have come on people yeah so somebody chimed in saying the position the camera window at the top center so it looks like you're looking at them okay I will say this, as long as we're not, I'm going to riff a little bit <laughs> because I recognize, um, I looked at, so I've been doing these webinars and we've been recording them <clears throat> and I, I had the opportunity to just take a quick look um, at how they worked out. And I am noticing, I don't, you know, I don't know, Scarlett, you'll have to tell me, do I make these strange faces when I'm one-on-one -on -one with people? I'm noticing that I've got a Zoom face going. 
I'm doing a lot of, <clears throat> maybe it's, you know, sort of psychologically, I'm uncomfortable talking to, uh, not to a person, but to a camera. And I noticed like, you know, some of these, my mouth's going like this, and I'm doing a little of this, I'm licking my lips a lot. I'm like, you know, so those are, these are like ticks that you get when, you know, and I've worked a lot on this over my career to be a better public speaker about how I don't, I try not to say, you know, or, um, or, you know, these sort of verbal ticks that you have, but I'm starting to recognize that, man, I'm getting these strange, you know, sort of uh, visual ticks because of Zoom. So I'm starting to become more aware of that. I don't know if I did it today, but you know, it's just sort of the feedback loop of your own feedback, you know, like looking at these things, like what, what are you doing? But that's yeah. something to be aware of, you know, it was just well, like, a friend, a friend chimed in saying that's, that's how you talk in person also. So it might just be, we're more, we're more aware of this on the camera. I look, so I'm, <laughs> I was thinking maybe it was a new thing. All right, well, there you go. That's feedback. Nobody's wanted to tell, hey, Dan, stop moving your mouth around like, like an idiot. All right. Well, that's fine. Then. Who said that? Aaron? Oh, my God. <laughs> well, I hope I have a sense of humor about it. I guess I do. And like Dan mentioned, we're going to be organizing a variety of meetups. We have some morning teas for the academic PAG. We have a town hall planned and uh, much more. So if anybody's interested, they can email any of the NEMA staff about organizing one of those for their area. Yeah, yeah. Right. Absolutely. Well, without any more questions, I will just uh, throw in there that this is, <clears throat> uh, you know, it's such a, an odd time for us uh, collectively, all of us, and I'm recognizing that. And, um, you know, we, we at NEMA are really trying hard to keep people connected as best we can. And, you know, so these, I mean, as I said, this one was planned quite a bit, you know, in advance, but, you know, we're trying to put as many of these opportunities together to connect via uh, actual content like this and just listening things. I did a mindfulness thing yesterday. We're doing another one. And any ideas that you all have for things that we can be doing to better serve you guys, connect you in this you know, very, very difficult time, both as museum professionals and as people, um, please let us know, really, because we're, we're so committed to your um, success and well-being and uh, you know we're trying to do what we can with what we've got right now and um, you know my message to all of us is that we've got to you know hang in there together we're we're together as a field and um, you know together we're going to be okay everybody's going to be okay it's going to be a different universe out there when we emerge but you know you guys are absolutely the most amazing people that I've ever worked with really as a, as a field. And um, I have every confidence we're going to, we're going to be great. And Dan, thinking about that kind of future, we do have one other question about virtual business cards. Usually conference hmm. apps allow people to exchange that info. Any success with that? Thoughts? Yeah, actually, Scarlett, you might be able to answer that better because you handled the app and know how people, I mean, we do know that over the course of the last few years, folks have been utilizing the app uh, to network with each other a lot more than they have in the past. Um, so I don't know how if we have any stats in the virtual. Yeah, meetings. I don't have the stats off the top of my head. I do know over the last three years of using Whova that um, there has been an increase in usage and people sharing info. So Matt, to your question, I'm not sure moving forward how folks might be exchanging business cards, but it might be more like a LinkedIn email kind of thing is my theory. <laughs> or it might just simply be, you know, here's my business card <laughs> and uh, write down the info. I don't, I don't know. Okay, everybody. Thank you for being with us. Stay in touch, stay well, stay, stay safe and so forth. Yeah. Thanks everyone.